Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Mindy here. And today I wanted to talk about a recent fragrance haul that just got delivered on Saturday. I've been playing with all of these over the past couple days and I'm excited to share them with you. Now, a couple things. We are starting to get some nasty weather rolling in. And so some of these fragrances are perfect both in warm and cool weather, which is great because it's looking like we're gonna get some cool weather here. And second, a lot of these are affordable. In fact, I think all of them are. And I'm a huge fan of affordable fragrances. Um, it's low risk in blind buying, which is what most of my fragrance purchases are. Um, but also it's fun when you come across an affordable fragrance that you absolutely love. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Please stay tuned if that interests you. And without further ado, let's get started. Okay, the first fragrance that I'm gonna talk about today is Hannah Mori, The Butterfly, and this is the EDP version. Now, I had some confusion when I was looking up this fragrance brand on FragranceNet or Fragrantica. I wasn't quite sure if it was actually called Butterfly or if it wasn't, but it is. So on here, I have the blue butterfly bottle right here, and this is the EDP version. And so when I look at the notes profile, there's berries at the top, floral in the mid, and woody notes at the base. So at the top you have strawberry, blackberry, blueberry, black currant. In the mid is ylang ylang, jasmine, rose, and peony. And then in the base is sandalwood, almond tree, Brazilian rosewood, and Virginia cedar. So when I smell this fragrance, what I'm picking up from this is definitely a woody vibe. There's a little bit of sweetness there in the background but the berries don't crumb across heavily to me. And so um, if, if you've been watching my channel at all, you know that I am a gourmandie, I love sweet fragrances, and I'm not really getting that from this one. And so I think that's why this is still sort of a like, it hasn't converted over into a love. I played with this for a couple days and it is a nice fragrance. I see this being very versatile for, um, for jeans and t-shirt wear, but also office wear. This isn't gonna offend anyone. And it's great for a series of different occasions. I get just the slightest bit of a nostalgic vibe from this. I feel like I've smelled it before. I don't know where and when, but it does feel somewhat familiar to me. So there's a possibility you have smelled this butterfly version in the past. Now, to me, when I'm comparing it to the other butterfly bottle that I have, and this is Hannah Mori Hannah. I don't know if this is an EDP or EDT. Let me look at the bottle. It's an EDP and it's the Hannah version. This is the red butterfly. This is different. They're, they're very different fragrance profiles. From the Hannah version, I get a lot of sweetness. I get a lot of berries. It's reminiscent very much so of Flower Bomb. I think this would be an excellent option for somebody who wants that Flower Bomb vibe but doesn't want to pay that Flower Bomb price. Um, just an awesome option for that. Um, but this one is just okay to me. So I need to play with it. I need to discover it a little bit more and see if it translates over to a love. But for now, this is a like. And I think a lot of people would enjoy this fragrance. That is Hannah Mori Butterfly EDP. Okay, the next fragrance that I blind bought, all of these are blind buys, is White Tea by Elizabeth Arden. And this is a pleasant fragrance, just like Hannah Mori. It's very pleasant. This one actually reminds me a little bit of a spa. It's fresh, it's aromatic, and for whatever reason, this is sort of reminiscent of something I've smelled before. I do enjoy this fragrance profile, um, but I tend to have a little bit of difficulty with aquatic fresh fragrances. I like them, but a lot of times they don't translate over to loves for me. I tend to like, again, those sweet. I have a type. I'm a gourmandie, and I tend to really enjoy and want to wear and crave those sweet, fruity, vanillic fragrances. And this one is more fresh. It's more on the aromatic side. And for that reason, I'm not sure I absolutely love this tea profile. To me, this feels a little bit like a soapy type fragrance, and I was really hoping this would be my Elizabeth Arden, this would be my tea fragrance, um, but I think I need to keep up the hunt and try to find the right one for me. I've also played a little bit with um, Green Tea by Elizabeth Arden. I brought this into my collection last summer. I know a lot of people absolutely love these tea fragrances. Um, this was another one 
that I just wasn't wild about. And I think it just simply has to do with the fact that I'm finicky on these sort of fresh aquatic fragrances. This one is nice. It's very, very nice. Um, but it reminds me so much of a hotel lobby at Patriots Place in, you know, near Boston where the Patriots play. There's a Marriott Renaissance and it just reminds me so much of that hotel lobby. I don't know why, but when I smell this, that's exactly where it takes me. And while I like that set of the hotel lobby, it's very classy, it's elegant, it's not something I wanna smell like. So unfortunately, at this point in time, the tea fragrances by Elizabeth Arden don't work for me. I think this will be perfect for somebody who likes that fragrance profile. This is perfect for everyday wear. Somebody would love this as a signature scent. It is very pretty. And I think the sillage from this would be stunning. There is something in it that has a little bit of an addictive quality. And I'm not exactly sure what that is. I don't know if it's the tonka bean or the woods that come together, but there's something unique in here. And I do think this is a fragrance genre, a fragrance brand, a fragrance style that a lot of people would enjoy. That is White Tea by Elizabeth Arden. Okay, next up is Organza Indecence by Givenchy. And this is the bottle. I have a tiny bottle for this fragrance. Seems like the demand for this one is through the roof. My guess is that supply is sort of down because I think this may have been discontinued. So it seems like there are a lot of people that are trying to get their hands on this one and prices seem to be very high. I was looking for vintage bottles on eBay and they range from 160 to 345 US dollars. And I honestly just wanted to see what the hype was all about. I had seen that this was a highly rated fragrance in the past. It has this vintage quality. The bottle is stunning. There was a lot I wanted to explore about this fragrance. So I'm really excited, even though this is the tiny bottle, I'm excited to have pulled this into my collection and have the opportunity to explore this one. So what does it smell like? It is spicy. Right outside the gate, I pick up on a lot of spice. Um, there's cinnamon in here, it's mixed with vanilla, and there's some patchouli that gives us a little bit of earthiness. There's amber in here as well. And the first thing that I thought when I smelled this fragrance, and I hope I'm not doing a disservice to this one, um, is when we go to those tourist towns and in certain pockets in Colorado, there's a lot of shops and going into the shops and smelling some of the high quality candles that they have, thinking about the cinnamon candles, the really fancy ones, that's what this reminded me of. But then I thought about it a little bit more and I thought this goes way deeper than just a candle. There is a lot of depth to this almost like an incense-like feel, but there's not incense in here. I think a lot of people would really appreciate this fragrance. It has a vintage vibe, it is very nostalgic, but I definitely get sort of a good feel, a good vibe from this. It is warm, it's cozy, it's spicy, and I definitely think if this is something that's in your wheelhouse, you're interested in, you might wanna get your hands on this because it seems like there aren't a lot of these out on the market anymore. I do believe it has been discontinued. That is Organza Indecence by Givenchy. Next up is Always Red by Elizabeth Arden. And there were a few reasons I wanted to pick this up. First, it's a cheapie, and so I was naturally curious. It seems to be highly rated. Um, but second, it is compared often to Armani C, and I was just curious if that were the case. And then third, it also has pink freesia, mahogany, and praline in it. And I thought those would be an interesting notes combination. Mahogany, I haven't seen in many fragrances. Freesia tends to be one of the floral notes that I enjoy, and I always like praline in my fragrances, so I thought this would be an interesting combination to check out. So, what I immediately pick up from this is some fruitiness, it's nice, it's sort of seductive. Um, I do find this to be syrupy, but in a grown-up way. I think this would be an awesome option for somebody who wanted Armani C but didn't want to pay full price for that particular brand. Um, another thing about this one, and I pick up on it, is that it has the slightest bit of a cherry vibe to it. 
There's no cherry in this. There is plum, blood orange, and passion fruit, but multiple people have mentioned picking up cherry. So whether it's like a secret hidden note in this fragrance or it just seems to give off that vibe, it is something that I'm picking up here and I enjoy. Armani C is not a fragrance that I'm totally familiar with. I've smelled it before. I've smelled most of the flankers, but I'm not completely familiar with the fragrance profile. The only Armani C that I have in my collection is the Le Parfum version, and I like this one as well. This one is also very seductive. It has sort of this wine quality to it, almost like a booziness. Whereas this one's like that. It has a little bit of that, maybe the slightest bit of a booziness quality. This one seems to be more wearable to my nose. So if you're looking for something that is wearable on a daily basis, something that smells lovely, slightly seductive, but not overly so, I think this would be a nice one to check out. I'm really enjoying this fragrance. I think it has a very addictive quality to it. It makes you want more of that syrupiness, that warmth, that depth that it has. And while I mentioned I'm not totally familiar with the Armani C fragrance profile, at this point in time I've smelled it before, but it's been quite a while, I do really like this. And I think if you're looking for that type of vibe and you want it at a very reasonable price, this is an excellent option to check out. That is Always Red by Elizabeth Arden. Okay, the next fragrance I wanted to talk about is Boy to Iris by Van Cleef and Arpels. I'll link it up here because I'm probably saying that wrong, but this is another stunning fragrance from the house of Van Cleef and Arpels. This is a house I'm interested in exploring a little bit more. Of course, I have Orchid Evene. I've tried Moonlit Patchouli, Moonlit Patchouli, but I'm definitely interested in exploring this house more because this is another stunning fragrance that I've been exploring. This one has such a noticeable iris note with a little bit of vanilla in the background and this is a dry fragrance. It's dry. Did I mention it's dry? It's different from the other fragrances that I have in my collection and I like that about it. It's delicious, it's sweet, it's woody, and iris tends to be one of my favorite fragrance notes it has a coolness to it. It's not completely warm like a lot of the fragrances that I have, and that's really appealing about this one. It has a slightly powdery quality to me as well that I just find to be alluring. And one thing I will say about this is I asked my husband if he liked it, hoping that he would, and he was not crazy about it, so that surprised me. I just assumed everyone would love this. So just something to keep in mind if this is one you are considering exploring. Um, this may or may not be considered crowd pleasing. I absolutely love this. Okay, there are two other fragrances in my collection that sort of remind me of Boy to Iris. Now, the first that comes to mind is Eau Dwell. And these two do not share any of the same notes with the exception of vanilla. So I mentioned this is sort of a cool, dry, vanilla iris fragrance. And Odwell has no iris in it, from what I can tell, but it has vanilla and this fresh, spicy, sort of cool tone to it as well. I don't know if it could be warm and cool at the same time, but there is sort of this spicy feel to this fragrance and sort of this fresh-ish type vibe. And I think that's probably because of the green notes in here and I get the slightest bit of that in Boy to Iris, and so it made me think of Eau Dwell, and probably one of the reasons that I might not consider adding this to my collection. The other fragrance that Boy to Iris slightly reminds me of is Dior Homme Intense. Now, they do have different scent profiles, they smell different, but they do have this sort of similar vibe, and the reason I'm picking up on that, I think, is just the strong, iris presence in both of these fragrances. So the only notes that these two fragrances share in common are iris and vetiver. And to me, you definitely pick up the iris in both. I think both of these are fantastic fragrances. I think this one leans more masculine. This is marketed to men. Whereas Boy to Iris, to my nose, smells perfectly unisex. I think a man can wear it. I, can, I think a woman can wear it. 
One thing that I noticed was most Fragrantica users seem to rate this one to be more feminine. That's not what I pick up. It really leans right down the middle for me. There's driftwood in here, there's myrrh. There's nothing overly sweet about it. There's nothing overly fruity or anything like that to me that makes it lean feminine. It really is right down the middle to my nose and I think that makes it a beautiful fragrance. Now there's a couple reasons that I'm really on the fence with whether I would move forward with a full bottle of Boyda Iris. Um, first, you know, my husband's not crazy about it. I asked him for his opinion yesterday and it doesn't seem like he's smitten with it like I am and I wonder if it has to do with that powdery sort of dry vibe. Another reason I might not want to bring Boy to Iris into my collection is I just ordered Boy Dore by Van Cleef and Arpels and I really, really love that fragrance. So I'm not necessarily there uh, to move forward with this one yet, um, but I'll see. I'm going to keep playing with this and see if it's one that I need a full bottle of. You know, third, I have a couple other fragrances that are along the same lines. They do not smell the same, but Odwell has a similar vibe. Uh, Dior Homme Intense has a similar vibe, and my husband does wear that fragrance from time to time. So I'm sort of getting the vibe out of this one that I like in those couple fragrances. So I may not move forward with this one for that reason. You know, the last reason I might not move forward with this one is that I already have an 8 mil decant. This will probably last me for quite some time, so I'll continue to play with this. This is one that is calming, it's soothing, it's comforting to me. So this might be one that I wear you know, after a bath, in the evening, to get calmed down, get ready for bedtime, and one I'll keep playing with a little bit to figure out if it's full bottle worthy, but I'm not there yet. I'm gonna continue to explore it, and we'll see in the future. That is Boy to Iris by Van Cleef and Arpels. Okay, the last fragrance that I'm gonna talk about today is Amber Oud Rouge by Al Haramain. And everyone knows at this point that Baccarat Rouge 540 is a very sought after fragrance profile. It exploded over the past couple years and it is very heavily talked about in the fragrance community. And so, like many others, I am no stranger to dupes, to clones. I have Alexandria Fragrances. I've been playing with Instant Crush by Mancera. I have Ariana Grande Cloud. And I've also added this one to my collection as well. I recognize this is a heavily controversial topic in the fragrance community. You know, a lot of people don't respect clone houses or dupe houses simply for the fact that they take that artistry, you have an esteemed perfumer, they use, you know, top quality ingredients to build this beautiful fragrance and then, you know, people come out of the woodwork and start cloning these fragrances. But I also see the flip side of it, you know, where you have people out there who either can't spend $250 on a fragrance or they won't spend $250 on a fragrance and I think this is a great way for people to have the opportunity to explore that fragrance profile without paying that price. Me personally, I've gone out to the Maison Francis Kirkjohn website at least seven or eight times at this point. I went there again this past weekend before this fragrance arrived. I debated buying Baccarat Rouge 540, but I just can't seem to actually hit buy. And part of that is just the price point. I haven't wanted to take away from other fragrances that I'm exploring because I bought that one. And quite frankly, I am a frugal person and I haven't been able to push the button just yet on that one. So we'll see what the future holds. Now for this, it's very similar to Baccarat Rouge 540. It has a sweet burnt sugar feel. Um, I definitely pick up on that medicinal quality in this fragrance as well. I put it side by side on my hand. So I had Baccarat Rouge 540 on this hand earlier today, Amber Oud Rouge over here, and went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the risk of doing that with this particular fragrance in Baccarat Rouge 540 is simply that a lot of people go nose blind to it. And I felt like that was happening to me while I was playing with it. But there are a couple things that I noticed. I get just a hint of a fruit punch vibe. I've mentioned that before from both the original Baccarat Rouge 540 as well as Amber Oud Rouge. But that goes away once it's on the skin for a while. You get the slightest hint of saltiness from the ambergris. There is so much character from the saffron and musk in this fragrance. And I think this is an excellent dupe of Baccarat Rouge 540. And the only couple things that I'd say is that Baccarat Rouge 540 smells the slightest bit more refined. 
It's hardly noticeable, and when you compare them side by side, they smell very, very similar. The other thing that I would say is that Amber Oud Rouge could be considered ever so slightly more fresh. Um, Baccarat Rouge 540 could be ever so slightly more sweet, but I really truly believe when you compare them side by side, it's hard to tell the difference. I don't know in a blind comparison test that somebody would be able to pick out the difference. I'd be interested to try. For the fragrances I've tried out and the dupes I've tested for Baccarat Rouge 540, this one comes the closest. Now when I think about the x Alexandria Fragrances has a strong contender, but for me, for the original, Amber Oud Rouge is the winner so far. It's a nice fragrance. I think a lot of people would enjoy it and it's at a reasonable price. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you had a great weekend and I'm wishing you a fantastic week. Until next time, I'll see you soon.